Wait one second, make sure I'm recording, I should be recording now. Okay, hello and welcome back to Random Game Ram Days. In today's episode, we're playing the Wolf of the Re. I cannot say it now. Derivian. Derivian? I think that's how you say it. Derivian. Okay, but I will turn off the music because I do not want copyright, I tell you. Do 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 do. No, I won't. I don't do text skipping now. Okay, so we'll just jump right into this. this. Is a game that we got from Key Mailer. In from the cold, chapter one. Let's see what's on this uh, kind of story. I tell you, I'm going into this completely blind, and also that background kind of reminds me of when oil kind of particles are in water. Reminds me of that. Just it's not colourful like a rainbow. Oh, I was supposed to click. How was I supposed to know that, I tell you? Now, the game is basically like a paper kind of thing. You get a little bit of a picture and you have to piece it all together. Movement in the corner of, our, of your eye. A flash grizzled grey half concealed by a by the thorny underbush. You look up from the path. Nothing. It might have been the wind. It might have been the wind. That's what they all say, and then they took an arrow to the knee. Might have been a startled pheasant, but you've learned to trust your instincts and start prickling at the back of your neck, says Wolf. And the prickling at the back of your neck, says Wolf. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, I don't actually know what direction I'm heading. So how can I head west or east? Examine the path. Wheels, ruts, shallow but still distinguishable. A half rotten plank fallen from some wagon long ago. A lost grub, glove, traces of humanity. How strange that you once lived among these things. Head down west or east. Head up the east. A elk lies on the path, its legs splayed out straight. As though in death, it's still trying to flee. Its throat and belly had been laid open, entrails spilling into the dust. The path beyond Peter's, out until it's swallowed by the forest. Examine its injuries. The edges of the wounds are ragged, torn rather than sliced. This is not the work of human hands. A predator took down this elk. A wolf, maybe. But it left without gorging it itself. Galgen. Perhaps you frightened it off, perhaps. Living out here, as long as you have, you feel the forest around you. Living out here, as long as you have, you feel the forest around you. The way air mines know to turn white in the winter. The way foxes know which way is nor, and you sense that there is something unnatural about the skill. Search the area. You didn't survive this long by being a fool. You know a suspicious scene when you see one. Curiosity, you search the underbush around the elk, placing your feet as lightly and deliberately as a dancer. Fern tendrils, molden leaves, and there's a hint of gleam. There's something metal, half hidden under the elk's hind leg, and I wedged there, bl blade up. But this knife didn't kill the elk. How then did it end up here? Take it. The blade is shiny, unspeckled, and corrosion. It hasn't been here long. You wipe the knife or oh, poop. Now the smell is all over our clothes. You wipe the knife on your clothes and slip it into your pocket. As you do, something catches your eye. There's a disturbance in the leaf from the elk's death struggle. And there within it, the impression is too smeared and instinct to tell what sort of beast created it. 
but it might have been a footprint pointed, pointed toward the spot where you saw the spectre though. Follows Brent. You hand that your hand on the hilt of your sword, you slip into the bushes, your bast shoes noiseless on the moss. You reach the clear where you spotted movement, nothing not so much as a squirrel. Examine the clear. You kneel and look over the leaf litter with the eye of long experience. Not a footprint, not tough or not a tough of fur. But wait here. On this adel adler sapling, some s snapped swigs. Something has been that way. Follow the trail. You creep fo through the w forest, alert for any kind of hint of a beast on the prowl. Perhaps this is why you don't see the patch of leaves artfully placed on the ground. Perhaps you simply aren't accustomed to looking for the work of human hands. You jump back as tree trap springs. It doesn't catch you, your foot, but it jaws snap onto the side of your calf biting deep through the skins you wear. Pain sprangles your vision with spots of light. You stagger to one knee and grab your leg. Your hands immediately stick with blood. Examine the wound. You ging gingerly ging gingerly pull away the torn edges of your clothes. The trap has sliced through muscle and tendon. You glimpse a hint of white beneath. Another gush of blood bandage the wound. Your, you root through the rut sack of yours, old stripes of cloth. The long faded last remnants of your bokater tunic. You wrap them nearly tourniquet tight around your leg and press down with both hands biting your lip the cloth is instantly saturated and the bleeding shows no sign of slowing there's nothing for it you're going to need real medical attention head to the village for help you're not sure how you wished to rent her society but it wasn't like this staring against the trees for support a trail of bloody footprints making your path now we're gonna be caught. The village looms ahead. The church onion dome rising above the icebergs. Carved ridge poles. You hear low voices. See a couple of people in the village square drawing water from the well. They haven't caught sight of you yet. When people look at you, they usually assume you are. They're not sure. <laughs> People have always been unsure what to make of you, even when you were famed. When you were a famed bogater, how they will react to a grizzled creature dressed in skins? Well, you'll soon find out. You gear yourself up for the looks, the questions, striding boldly. Hmm. Creeping quality. You tumult of the tumult of voices, the close press of bodies. It's too much for you to face all at once. You creep quietly around the outskirts of the village, like a scavenger in search of food. You crouch in the shadow of Isba's rough log walls. The building before you is larger, with a wrought iron lantern hanging over the door a inn maybe. Behind the village rises a hill crowned by a manor which slopes down to the edge of a placid pond nestled against the woods. Let's see, doctor would probably be in a manor. Head for the pond
headed for the pond. Shying away from the village like a deer that has caught the scent of humans, you round the bottom of the hill. The pond is black and stagnant, and it smells of decay in summer reeds. You grow unsettled with each step, the grass behind you. Slick with your own blood. You need the villagers' help if you're to have any chance, yet it seems easier to let nature take its course. You nearly stumble over a woman with long braids who's sitting on the hillside looking at the pond. She starts to start, starts to her feet when she notices you and shoots you a accuracy and scare glare. Not scare. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to disturb you. She runs off without speaking. She noticed the, your condition. She made no sign of it. Head for the inn. The inn's door has flower painted on it. It is cheerfully green and yellow. Hesitant, you take a hold of it and slip inside. Womble like warmth and dimness shallow you. Bundles of herbs hang from the roof. Beams and masonry stove dominates the wall. The air is close, close, with lingering smell of bodies. A woman in an apron is bent over the stove, honestly. Brace Slev. It's, it's not even noon, she says before she turns and sees you. She's middle aged, with a kind of but, with a kind but care woman face. Dark blonde hair slipping from her cap. Oh, another burst of pain stabs through your leg as you put your weight on it. Wrong. And you collapse onto one of the rough few benches that scatter the room. Your vision swims through la hazily, hazy darkness as all your weakness catches up to you at once. The woman in the apron sighs up, sizes up the situation at a glance. She peels away from the dirty fur and bandages crusted to your leg with dry blood and clicks her tongue at the sight of ragged wound. What happened? A trap. A trap. Stupid of me. I should have seen it. The woman sighs and shakes her head. As praise love. I'm always telling him that he sets his traps too close to the village. You're lucky it isn't worse. No broken bones, at least. But it'll need stitches. As she goes to fetch a needle and thread, she says, I'm Mila, by the way. Do you have a name? What what do they, you give you? Dragamiha, Sasha. Yekatrina. Dragomia. Something easy, you know, to remember. <laughs> well, Sasha's also. Well, Dragomir, I imagine this will be nothing compared to all the things you have been through. But some liqu liquid fortitude still would won't go amiss. I was gonna say you need something to, you know, singy. She pours you a sweet uh, wooden cup of meadow yucca. It's sweet and cloying on your tongue. The taste of the eve of battle. Grogging half conscious from loss of blood. You had to feel as Mila stitches you up and wraps your leg and with politesis. When she's finished, she helps you onto the top of the stove, which is covered in rugs and warm as a horse flank. You vaguely feel her unbuckling something from your side, your sword. Let her take it. There's no need to fight. She's, you know, helping us. She takes your sword for the first time in years. You're defenseless. You curl up in the, in the pile of rugs and fall asleep as a weak child. You awaken to rich aroma of stew and meat. Mila is at the table below, mincing herbs and humming to herself. Mila looks up. You must be famished. It'll take you a few days to recover yourself. You helped me. Why? I'll well, help a injured traveller in desperate need of assistance. What a world are we in that you need to ask such a question? 
She pauses with the knife in her hand, looking at nothing. Do you know there was a time when man would help his fellow man merely because it was the Christian thing to do? Those were the days. You lapse into quiet reminiscence. Climb down from the stove. You climb down from the stove. Mila is ladling the stew into wooden bowls. A shaggy grey tabby sits in front of the stove. Pet the cat. You scratch the cat's ears. He flicks his ear. His name is Calm, says Mila. He utterly, he's utterly useless. Well, he is a cat. Well, he is a cat. What do you expect? Absolutely nothing. What village is this? Pet Calm. You, you tickle Calm's chin. He ignores you. What village is this? It's called Dervina, says Mila. I don't imagine you've heard of it. Nothing happens here. Well, nothing to talk about. Pet Calm. You stroke Calm's back. He yawns. You scratch Calm's ears. He sneezes. If you're making any headways up at Perfendum, you're not sensing it. You stroke Calm's back. He twitches his tail. You tickle. He blinks at you. You tickle Calm's chin. He flicks his ear. You stroke Calm's back. He blinks at you. You strap Calm's ears. He ignores you. You tickle the day he sneezes. Twitches his tail. He yawns. He sneezes. He twitches his tail. Just this person just constantly, you know, petting your cat like an old maniac. Pet Calm 20 times in one playthrough. <laughs> Pet Calm another time. You know, not many people get that achievement, and then there's me. I want to see how many times until, you know, he becomes my best friend. I'm seeing if we can do this a hundred times, I tell you. He doesn't like me petting him so much, he yawns, he sneezes, he twitches. He doesn't like it too much, he blinks at me too much. We're just petting him now. Just pet the kitty. There we go. Pet the kitty. Just about like, you know, a menace to this cat, I tell you. What's the log like? That's a lot of cat stuff. Save. Resume. Accept a bowl of stew. You take a seat at the table and accept a bowl she offers you. The broth is thick and brown and steam rises off of it. It scalds your tongue but you drink it like a starving animal ignoring a spoon. Salt and herbs you can't remember the last time someone cooked for you. Mila sits opposite of you. You now realize she isn't as old as you thought. Not nearly looking past her work. Roughly hands. She can't be more than 30. Those eyes, those... Though there's something in those distant eyes, 
like she's seen empires rise and fall. So where are you from? asked Ela. Novgorod? I'm I'm pretty sure Nov Novgorod is what I came before let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew I heard about somewhere. Novgorod, the Great, one of Russia's oldest cities, historic cities. That's where I heard about it. Sorry, I'm just checking something. I can't believe, you know. Well, well if I say Novgorod, you know what? We'll just say Novgorod. Novgorod. She looks up, her interest peaked. Novgorod the Great? Where Kanaz lives? The very same. But the grandeur of the court is not what you remember of Novgorod to you. Novgorod was modernized. The hubbub -hub of the market square, the smoke of the forges, the stink of fishmongers, the clamor of hoofs and feet on the slick, woved wood paved street. Do you serve him? Yes, I fought in the wars, but that was a long time ago. She says, you've been out here on your own all this time? Yes, all alone. I am now, but I wasn't always. I used to travel with... My grandfather. My grandfather. To you, your grandfather was gnarled hands and coarse ash colored beard, the smell of horse and leather. He was a warrior, one of the great bogaters of the last age, but he was so humbled that you never realized just talking by talk just by talking to him. He taught you taught me that he talk, talking to me to him. He taught me to swing a sword to identify plants, everything I know. Wait one second. You know what? I don't expect this game to take place in uh, Russia. Well, places, I tell you. Well, pre Russia. Not Russia yet. Novogorod. And then it's uh, that other one, and then it's Russia. That's what it is, I tell you. Many people forget that like, the early times of you know Russia, before it was Russia. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Sorry, I need to check something while I'm, you know, reading this. I tell you. I think we might uh, pack up, you know, and end this episode very soon. I tell you, as it is getting pretty long. I tell you. Ah, uh, let's see. The memories blood in on Biden. On Biden. On On Biden. We were inseparable. We rode side by side on two great war horses. Fought back to back on the lake of ice. Saved each other's lives. I don't know how many times. I thought that. As long as we were together, nothing could stop us. And what happened? Now she's getting nosy. Say nothing. You lock eyes with her and drink your stew in silence. Pointed silently. Mila gives you a patient smile. After a minute or so, it sinks in that you've been ridiculous, but you're damned if you're breaking the silence. But Mila says, The fire in the stove is out. I would draw. I could draw you a bath. That would. That would be lovely, actually. Mila holds a cast iron tub out from the corner, places it inside the stove, and fills it with water. She hangs a blanket over the stove mouth, stove's mouth for privacy. You slip and slide. You slip inside. It's hazy with steam and easily roomy. Enough for a grown person. It takes time to strip your clothes off, layer upon layer of 
of skins and furs basted together and or tied with thongs, all plastered together with old mud and sweat. You slip inside the tub, with a side of warm water is soon cloudy and brown. Parasites slow to, to the surface, wriggling in their depths froze. You attempt to rake some out some of the worst snarls out of your hair with your fingers, but it's no use. They probably need to be cut out. You scrub yourself trying to get the black grime out under your nails and in your in the creases of your palms. But even when your skin is clean, you can't shake the feeling that something is still clinging to you like a shadow. When you emerge, Mila isn't there. She laid out a fresh caftan tunic, trousers, there's even a pair of newly woven based shoes. Put on the fresh clothes. The caftan is very, very red, with patterns of leaves embroidered around the sleeves and the lower hem. It's a little too large for you. There are faint scents of stains under the arms. You wonder who wore it before you. You wonder if Mila made it herself. Who spent all those hours embroidering the leaves for? Mila re-enters re re the inn. A few hours later, a basket of marsh peppers on her arm. You're looking significantly more human. How are you feeling? Better. Better. Your colour is back anyway. She presses her hand to your forehead and no sign of fever. You you are one lucky traveller. You finger the hem of your cuftan, a tear well a tear has been mended cunningly, concealed with a bird in orange embroidery thread. Did you do this? you asked. It's so elaborate. Mila chuckles. Oh, that's just a little private joke. Everything is improved by adding a firebird. I figure if you need to repair something, you may as well make it look nicer than it did before. You have a gift. I have a joke with who? No one. Someone I knew a long time ago. You say, I feeling, you say, I'm feeling stronger. I think I might get out and stretch my legs a little. If you walk with a staff, you ought to be alright around a little place like Deverna, says Mila. Just don't try anything silly unless you want to swoon again. I did not swoon. Mila gives you a look over the top of her nose. You were scarcely conscious when you showed up here. A few more minutes and it would have been too late for you. I'm merely saying to be pundit. You're outfitted with a sturdy oak staff. Smooth polished patches worn into by ha other hands. Your sword rests by the door like a sleeping guard dog. Leave it. You leave your the sword resting against the door frame. Though you feel weak and helpless about it, you step glinking into a mild September mid afternoon. You ha must have slept half the day away. The village square, such as it is, is only patch is is only a patch of well trodden mud in the center of a cluster of isbans. A small church stands before you, its roofs, vaults and lofty onion dome, all built of the same weathered mossy wood. Across from it stands the inn. Staren has stopped, well Staren's stopped, at least although you catch a few curious glances from the villagers, think you're not looking. A young man is splitting logs. Doctor the man. He's, he sits, sets down his axe and pushes his hair out of his face. 
He's lanky and handsome in a stony way. Fluntly eyes, a queen nose, sharp chin. So, you're the ragged beggar everyone is talking about, he says. I'm not a beggar. Do you always show such courtesy to strangers? We have no use for strangers here. Have I done something to anger you? Nothing you do could matter to me. One way or another, he brings the axe down again. This the com this conversation's getting away. Do 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 do. Enter the church. The nave of the church is rich with the scent of incense. Uh, the walls are rough planks, and the incostances is gilt and covered in lovely rendered portraits of the saints. Excellent burp there. A priest sits on a bench by the door, poring over slim con codex with a cracked black leather cover. A curly grey beard falls down his chest and he has a kindly face with crinkles around the corners. Of his eyes, his cassock is cassock is well warm but tidy. Talk to the priest. When he sees you, he brightens and closes his book. Ah, you must be the stranger everyone is talking about. I must say, I've been keen to meet you. My name is Father Cyril. What can I do for you? What does the good book have to say today? I wish to receive Holy Communion. Hmm. What does the good book have to say today? What's this? He looks down at the book clasped in his hands. It's not the good book, but the tale of Igor's campaign. A poem about Igor Sayavioto Slavic Slavic the Brave and his de great defeat at the river Kay Kayala Kayala Quite fascinating, do you read? I never learned, ah. Uh, then shall I teach you? I like that. His face brightens, then we shall begin tomorrow. Join me and on from here, after the divine lit liturgy, on from you say, who's that? Oh, he's a little boy you've probably seen run around, says Father Cyril. Quite a sweet child. It's a shame that villagers don't treat him better. These old su superstitions so hard to uproot. Hmm. Holy Communion? I wish to receive the Holy Communion. You missed it, I'm afraid, says Father Cyril. Come tomorrow for Divine Liturgy and you may see it then. I'd just stay here a while, if you don't mind. Of course, everyone is welcome in the house of God, says Father Cyril. I'll give you a few minutes by yourself. He takes his book and goes behind the in Constasis, you are alone with God. Pray. You kneel and kiss the cross. The words of the prayer you learned as a child form an instinctively on your lips. But there is a emptiness behind them. You're not forgiven. How could you be? Just stand in silence. You abandon an attempt to feel near to God, just stand there, bathed in the light of the candles. Look around. Your eyes wander over the saints on the incostances. Their delicate brush strokes and cracked yellow varnish, they regard you beneficially through these, through their large brown eyes. Their gaze convicts you. Their gaze convicts you. You feel naked before them. 
their eyes cutting through you like the sharpest blade. Your life is laid bare before them, every darkest shadow, every corner where you might hide. You leave the church. And you know where where we should well this is what this is where we got ended. So hopefully you still enjoy this, have a nice day safe, hope it's helpful, maybe some more shows, need keep the vitamins very important, and bye, see you next time, bye, see you, see you, bye bye.